The earth is the Lord's and everything that is in it, the whole world and everyone who dwells therein. If you will open to Psalm 24 this morning, Psalm 24, we're going to read through that text of Scripture and meditate on its meaning and its significance for God's people today. Psalm 24, the earth is Yahweh's and all its fullness, the world and all those who dwell in it, for he has founded it upon the seas, he established it upon the rivers. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. For he shall receive blessing from Yahweh and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord. Strong and mighty, Yahweh, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates, and lift up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? Yahweh of hosts. He is the King of glory. If there is anything that we should take away from this psalm for our meditation this morning, I pray that it will be this. That worship is a grand privilege, but it is not a right. Worship is absolutely necessary for us to survive spiritually, but it is not something that is owed to us. It is a privilege and not a right. Now here I'm not talking about being an American, where... Worship, according to the dictates of conscience, is indeed a right as far as the constitution of this nation is concerned. It is the first of the what we call the Bill of Rights. But I'm not talking about being an American. I'm talking about a, an authority that is much higher than the authority of this nation, and it reaches to the authority of heaven itself. An authority that is higher than that of Washington, D.C., that extends to the very Mount of Zion, where the king dwells, where the victorious Lord is enthroned. The Bible students that I've read explain that this Psalm 24 is a processional liturgy. It is that which is sung and repeated and rehearsed when the king, who is victorious in battle, returns to his home in order to sit enthroned in the temple on Mount Zion. He ascends the hills of Jerusalem and he ascends Mount Zion, the top of that set of hills, into the temple. He has his entourage that sings songs of victory and celebration in awe of the king and his power and his might. On Wednesday nights, we studied uh, last Wednesday night, Mark 11, and what we call the triumphal entry, where Jesus uses this framework in order to make his final entrance into Jerusalem for the last week of his life. And he plays off this entire processional Uh, strategy that is seen by the kings of Jerusalem of old, and we see it now superimposed over the greatest king ever, Yahweh himself. So the king that we are lauding and praising in Psalm 24 is no mere human king. This indeed is Yahweh, the Lord of hosts of Israel. And so the call to worship, if you will, is found in the first two verses. The earth is Yahweh's and all its fullness, 
the whole world and every person who dwells in it. Because like a city, he has founded it upon the seas. His own city, he established it upon the rivers. And so the call to worship draws our minds to the fact that this is no mere human king. By right of creation and sustenance, he is the true king of the earth. And so he sits enthroned as he comes to Jerusalem from the field of battle, victorious and with his entourage of worshipers. And we're drawn to the fact that this is the great king of the universe. Now, traditionally, in church history, in centuries past, this psalm was sung on what is called Ascension Day, which is 40 days after the Passover, where we read in Acts chapter 1 that Jesus ascended. He ascended back into heaven and sat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty on high. And so they recognized in this, of course, a prophetic element where Jesus would be the greatest conquering king of all, both God and man, and that he would one day sit enthroned on high. And so it is fitting for us to ascribe to Jesus Christ that which is ascribed to Yahweh in Psalm 24, because indeed he is Yahweh, the Lord of the host of the armies of Israel. But in Israel's history, predating the advent of Jesus Christ uh, into the world, Israel sang this as the pilgrims returned to Zion every year for worship and for feasting in Jerusalem three times a year. This began as early as David's own enthronement psalms and enthronement ritual, and perhaps even uh, from First, Corinth, uh, First Chronicles, rather, verses 13 through 16, where David brings the ark of God into Jerusalem and they sing the processional songs there. Uh, some of them are actually listed in those chapters. And so you're seeing a very, um, a very important time in the history of Israel when a king returns victorious. And he brings the spoils to his people, and they laud him and worship him. Only here you have it amplified to the heights of heaven, to the very Zion itself, the poetic name for the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And yet the question is asked, who may be a part of this great procession? Who is the person who meets the moral requirements. In Psalm 24, beginning in verse 3, the question is asked, Who may ascend into the hill of Yahweh? Who is it that may stand in His holy place? What we have listed are moral requirements. There is a standard, no doubt, that must be met before you can acceptably worship the true King. We all need to worship, but not all have the requirements needed to approach God in worship. A standard must be met, and this was learned the hard way by people like Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus chapter 10, and Uzziah, or rather Uzzah in 1 Chronicles chapter 13, who treated the beauty and holiness of the Lord's things as if they were common things. The worship of God is just this holy. And it is just this essential that we come before Him bearing a holiness that is wrought from God. Certainly, a person, in order to worship Yahweh, in order to worship Christ acceptably, must be a Christian. But not even a Christian can approach God in worship unless... He maintains His holiness. Verse 4 says, Here's the one who may approach God in worship. The one who has clean hands and a pure heart and who has not lifted up his soul to that which is false nor taken an oath deceitfully. This is in the back of James's mind when he writes James 4 and verse 8. When he says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. 
Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your minds, your hearts, you double-minded. So the New Testament takes this passage and applies it to Christians and says to the Christians, you've been baptized into Christ indeed, you've been cleansed from your sins, you've been added to the Lord's body, but don't think that you can draw near to a holy God unless you yourself are maintaining faithfulness. Purity of thought, purity of life. Cleanse your hands. This has to do with everything that you do, everything, all the works that you are involved in, your daily activities must be holy. Whatever your hands find to do, do it with all of your might as to the Lord. Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 10. The New Testament again, Colossians 3.23. Whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. For it is from the Lord that you will receive the reward. Cleanse your hearts. This has to do with all attitudes, all intentions. That which drives and motivates you in your daily affairs. These must be sincere and without offense before the Lord. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Matthew 5 and verse 8. The Lord wants us to worship Him in spirit and in truth. John 4 and verse 24. So David asked in Psalm 51 and verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. He knew that he had to be cleansed not only of his sins, but also of his future intentions. Everything must be dedicated to a holy God because he's the one who's worthy. And he accepts worship only from those who seek him according to his own will. So we cannot expect to come off of a week of of lying and and hatred, double-mindedness, and enter into God and His worship acceptably. We're not to lift up our soul to that which is false. My translation says to an idol. It's there talking about the worship of that which is not God, that which is false, or taking oaths in the name of that which is false. No man can serve two masters. James calls this being double-minded. We must be singularly devoted to the God of heaven. And verse 5 explains the blessings. The results of the grace of the one who is worshipped. Verse 5, he shall receive blessing from Yahweh. Righteousness from the God of his salvation. And so not only is worship not a right that we have as people ontologically... It's rather a privilege given by God, but when God, by His grace, provides access to His temple, to His worship, to His praise, He actually gives us blessings as a result of it. He bestows blessings on those who don't even have a right to come before His his face. It's as we think about this great privilege of being able to to come before the throne of God as His people and and, and offer worship and praise and adoration in, in a spirit of holiness, living lives of purity, that we have come to miss that so much. Being able to gather together in a common assembly. There's been so many of you who have expressed a desire to return to the way that it was with a corporate worship service where we all could say like Psalm 122 and verse 1, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Because it brings joy, it brings fulfillment. And we recognize the privilege, not the right, but the privilege, and that the access that we have through Jesus has been given to us as a grace. And so that's why we need to reassemble once again. There were two main reasons why we chose in this congregation to modify our format in worship. 
because of the novelty of this virus and that there was no resistance to it naturally, we needed to protect the more vulnerable members. And there was no way to know who might be carriers, and so we chose, in accordance with the medical professionals, to separate uh, and social distance. And we chose to do this through smaller groups meeting. So the need to protect members was number one. And number two, there was a virtue, I believe, in helping to what was called flattening the curve, where we would try to reduce the stress on our medical system. And all of this required us to distance ourselves in order to slow the spread. And we had to do that in such a way that we modified the very format to where we met in smaller groups and we tried to bring each other together in heart and spirit through the technology that's available to us today. But this forced us to navigate a delicate balance between accomplishing these goals of distancing from one another while at the same time needing to meet together in order to worship and glorify God and reap the, the gracious benefits that we've been talking about where we can exalt Him in our praise but we can also encourage and strengthen one another by being together. Well, the curve has now been flattened. Hospitals are not overrun. Medical supplies and equipment are widely available. And we're so thankful to God for this. The elders believe we're now in a place where we do need to open the public assemblies again. And we need to return to corporate worship so that we can reap the benefits that God intends for us in that format. And clearly, we want to try to find the best way to do that. So we're asking the members of the church here in Farmersville to come back to worship, that we can open the doors once again, because you need it. You need corporate worship. It feeds your heart. It feeds your soul through the fellowship with fellow worshipers in a way that remote services really can't do. And I think most of us have come to see that in a very unique way, in a very real way, perhaps in a way that we couldn't know without it. So this modification of separate smaller groups was never ideal and it was never intended to be permanent. But just as importantly as this would be for you, it is that important for your brothers and sisters. Your brothers and sisters need you. They need to see you. I mean, isn't this what the Bible says? Let us consider one another and stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, but all the more exhorting one another as we see the day approaching. And so the Bible holds this out clear that the intention of public worship is not only for the praise and glory of God in one voice, in one place, but also for the edification of the church. And so now it seems that, that you, as a Christian, you have a delicate balance that now needs to be struck in your own life between perhaps the need to still distance yourself in order to feel safe, while at the same time coming and being with your brothers and sisters in corporate worship so that you can benefit them as they benefit you all to the Lord's glory. As you've probably heard the maxim, the cure shouldn't be more deadly than the disease. We believe that a prolonged period of separation can quickly become more deadly than the effort to contain the spread of a physical disease. And so we're going to, beginning next Sunday, the first Sunday of May, again, call a corporate worship um, in this building. We will continue to observe social distancing, as it has been called, where we're not going to shake hands. We will still sit uh, the six feet apart that has been suggested very difficult not to shake hands though by the way isn't it Galileo walked in and we were both going like this toward one another and was like wait there's a force field between us 
So that's going to take some time and, and some purposeful effort. But we do want to try to still practice that because the virus is still here. It's still among us. I don't believe that it is nearly the threat that it was, but um, we still want to observe this. We will cordon off every other pew here in the auditorium where we will only utilize every other pew for people to sit in. So no one is sitting directly in front of you or directly behind you. And we will set by households. So whether you're a single or a married couple or you have children, you'll set in a single spot separated from other households by at least six feet by the inside of the pew or the outside of the pew. If you sit on the inside of the pew, you can walk down the center aisle. If you sit on the outside of the pew, you can walk in the back doors and then go to the outside aisle. And that way you don't have to go through uh, the pews and cross, cross other people unnecessarily. We won't be congregating in the foyer, though I would encourage you to congregate outside in the sunlight and uh, visit while you can still maintain your distance and enjoy one another's company outside in the fresh air. We will continue to clean surfaces in the building between every service. Now, we will have an auditorium Bible class on Sunday mornings, again, starting at 10 o'clock, our regular Bible study time on Sunday mornings. For the time being, we will not have Bible classes for individual uh, grades and children. So all will have to meet with and stay with the parents uh, here in the auditorium for Sunday morning Bible class. We will get with the, the teachers and see how we can organize that and make sure that the teachers are on board and still be able to do this safely and wisely. But for the time being, the only Bible class on Sunday morning will be in the auditorium. We will open the doors, though, for all of our services. Sunday morning Bible class in the auditorium, Sunday morning worship in the auditorium, Sunday evening worship at 6 p.m. here in the auditorium, and then Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. here in the auditorium. I'm getting excited just talking about it. We will continue to live stream uh, on a regular basis for those who are still um, unwilling or unable to attend. And so we're asking you, as members of the church here, to prayerfully consider these things. If you truly do not feel safe or comfortable being in a larger crowd at this time, we understand that. We just ask you to seriously consider the Lord's will that we take the opportunity to meet together as a privilege. But that's totally up to you as an individual. We understand these are unprecedented times and difficult decisions have to be made. But please understand at the same time that the elders are trying to provide a safe environment while at the same time giving God glory in submitting to His pattern in its ideal form. We don't claim that anything is guaranteed. We don't claim that there's no possible way that you can get sick here because we don't know that. But we're hopeful and we're trusting. And we want to begin work toward full public service, public worship services. <clears throat> and we believe that we can start next Sunday morning uh, with the full schedule of services. <clears throat> Most importantly, we encourage you to come to the public gathering only if you're able to come to worship and be able to focus on God rather than somebody sitting down the pew from you. We want to be able to focus and offer the adoration and praise that God so richly deserves. We realize that not everyone will agree with the elder's decision here. We understand that, and we respect that. But it is our decision, and we're trying to serve and obey the Lord for your good. And sometimes that requires that we make decisions that might not be popular. But enough of that. 
what we see in the rest of the psalm is the height of the drama of it. Because a call goes out. A call goes out from the hills as the king is approaching. And the call goes out to the gatekeepers of the city to lift the gates, raise the doors so that the king can come in to his city. Lift up your heads, you gates, and lift up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is it that we're anticipating to come in? Who is this king of glory? Well, it's Yahweh, strong and mighty, the one who is mighty in battle. He is the Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. And with that, we show our intention for coming back together. To exalt God in the way that He has always deserved to be exalted. We need to worship God. And God is glorified whenever we worship Him in holiness. But not just anyone may draw near Him. Only those to whom it has been given by the blood of Jesus. And we conclude this lesson with a reading of Hebrews chapter 12. Because the writer here takes these Old Testament images, these Old Testament metaphors, these Old Testament types, and begins to apply them now to the church. And we see precisely where the church lies. The church is the true Zion. And so in verse 22 we read, You have come to Mount Zion, Christians, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, and to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn people who are registered in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. You have come to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to His blood, the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. And we ask you all to come, to come to Mount Zion to worship the holy God in a holy way. If you will bow with me, I'll lead us in a prayer and then we'll be led in our, in, uh, our, our songs. Father, we do thank you so much that we have the privilege of opening your word and seeing the great uh, processional liturgies that are written for us that we might see the excitement of your people and the anticipation and, and, uh, um, and, the, and the glory of coming to your house, of enthroning you in our hearts and in our minds and singing praises to you, because you are truly the only one worthy. The whole earth belongs to you. And as the prophet cried, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, the whole earth is full of your glory. We wish to exalt you in that way. Bless our efforts, and we pray that your will is done in this place. And give us wisdom, give us patience, and give us a drive and a zeal for that which is holy and that which is good. We love you and we thank you in the name of Jesus, your holy Son. And amen.